Frangelico's Annunciation in the Cortona Altarpiece is probably my favorite of the many Annunciation works. Beautiful and filled with symbolism, the painting provides us with a great deal to contemplate, which was exactly what Fra Angelico intended. Fra Angelico was a Dominican friar who was also an early Italian Renaissance painter. He was a friar first, a painter second. A spiritual man who sought to live out the religious truths he held, Fra Angelico created art to bring others into closer communion with God. When Angelico joined the Dominican order, he changed his name to Father John of Fizzoli. Later, he was nicknamed Fra Beato Angelico or Fra Angelico. His modest piety and his beautiful paintings earned him the nickname Father Angel or Father Beautiful Angel, and now he is almost universally referred to as Fra Angelico. The vast majority of his works were done for the monastery in San Marcos where he lived. During an extensive restoration, Fra Angelico was commissioned to take on the decorating of the building, creating a unified message of frescoes for the monks who lived there. The Dominicans were largely learned, urban individuals who embraced a contemplative lifestyle. The order valued education and produced many of the theologians and philosophers of the Middle Ages. Dominicans believed that preaching was not done by words alone, but also by example. The motto of the Dominicans is docere verbo et exemplo, or to teach by word and example. Their lives, transformed by the practice of meditation, prayer, and contemplation, were to be an integral part of their preaching. Study and contemplation were their chosen methods of overcoming threats to the church. The Dominicans considered art to be a useful vehicle to teach and educate and supported many artists financially. Fra Angelico was commissioned to create a fresco inside each of the cells or bedrooms of his fellow friars, and each cell had a large work that aided the monk who lived there in his daily devotions. These paintings indicate the kind of man Fra Angelico was, as they were only seen by the one monk living in the cell, yet they are complex, beautiful, fully realized works. As one would suppose, Fra Angelico's art revolved around religious themes, and one of his favorite subjects was the Annunciation. Fra Angelico was influenced by the international Gothic style, by the colors of Siena, and by Giotto's work. His work has the elements of the early Renaissance while retaining the elegant lines of Gothic painting. The piece we will focus on is an altarpiece, sometimes called a retable. That means that the piece sits on the altar or on a table placed behind the altar, as opposed to a piece which sits on the floor. It was first made for the Church of Gesù of Cortona, but has since moved into the museum. When this painting is referred to, the city Cortona is always included. So this is the Annunciation of Cortona. This is necessary because Fra Angelica painted so many Annunciations. As we read this work, we have the angel Gabriel arriving from the left to tell Mary that she is going to have a child. Mary is seated on the right in a portico reading her Bible. Gabriel is clothed in glory, quite literally, as we see the rays of golden light shining around him. The sumptuous pink color and gold thread of his robes evokes the riches of heaven. His wings are luminous. The angel has just stepped into Mary's garden and is intent on sharing the message he has been entrusted with. His head is jetted forward, his eyes intent on Mary. Each figure is framed by their own arch, yet even with a column between them, they are connected by their eyes and by the words that pass between them. Their bodies echo each other, leaning together. Gabriel's posture can almost be interpreted as bowing to Mary. Mary and Gabriel are also connected by Gabriel's gestures toward Mary. In art, it is always wise to take note of someone pointing. It's as if the artist is saying, here, pay attention. And in this case, Gabriel is pointing with one hand to Mary and with the other to God, as he explains why he has come. Mary and Gabriel are both spatially and spiritually connected in this moment. Mary is seated with her arms crossed, signifying humble acceptance. Mary is listening intently to the angel and making eye contact. In many annunciations, Mary has her gaze averted. 
But here we see her gaze is on Gabriel, as if she doesn't want to miss anything this angelic emissary has to say. Seated on a throne, we see a foreshadowing of Mary's future when she will be referred to as Queen of Heaven. Fra Angelico is not trying to recreate a historically accurate image of the angel's visit to Mary, but a theologically correct image. Angelico knows that Mary was a common young girl who would not have been arrayed in wealthy clothes, sitting on a throne, but he is communicating the mystery of the Incarnation or God taking on flesh. And so Mary wears rich clothing edged in gold and is seated upon a throne, indicating her position in the spiritual realm. Mary is clothed in a red robe, the color of blood and earth, a symbol of her humanity. She is covered by a blue cloak, denoting divinity, heaven, and royalty. Red and blue are commonly used by artists in this time period to emphasize the human mother Mary as carrying the divine within her. The color blue will commonly signify the Virgin Mary, but particularly during the period she is with child. For viewers, this helped to make visual the idea of the incarnation, that Christ left heaven and took on flesh, not only that he came to earth, but that he also came as a helpless baby. This coming together of humanity and divinity is hard to fully grasp. To elaborate on this idea, we have the angel Gabriel, a divine being, stepping into the walled garden, the world, bringing the message that the God of heaven in this very moment is entering into Mary, a human. The Annunciation is the moment of the Incarnation, and Fra Angelico uses multiple visual clues to remind us of this fact. Above Mary, we see a dove, the symbol of the Holy Spirit, in a burst of light. The Bible says that Mary will conceive a child miraculously by the Holy Spirit. And just above the dove is a rondelle with an older bearded man. Some have interpreted this to be God the Father, who was watching the unfolding scene. Others believe this is the prophet Isaiah, who prophesied, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. We should also note that Mary and the angel are too large for the building they are in. If Mary were to stand, her head would come to the ceiling. Again, Fra Angelico, while painting a realistic image in many ways, is more concerned with communicating spiritual truths, and he makes use of heretic scale meaning the size of the figures informs us as to their importance. The words that Mary and Gabriel exchange are written in the air between them. Gabriel's sentences are the top and bottom ones. The middle line is Mary speaking. Gabriel says, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Mary answers, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. The interesting thing about these painted words is that Mary's are upside down and read from right to left. This is because we are not the ones who are supposed to read the words. God is, and so they are oriented for God's view. As we move to the secondary scene in the work, I want you to note the colonnades that run down the side of the building behind the angel. The way the columns are painted is what is meant by perspective. Using mathematics, artists had begun to create a focal point, generally on the horizon line, or where the sky meets the earth, and to draw parallel lines out from that point so that they could orient objects correctly, and so that the images have depth. Think of a train track as they disappear into the distance and they appear to come together. In this painting, the vanishing point is to the left, unusual for Fra Angelico, and the pillars get smaller in an orderly way and appear to recess back into space. The same is true for the furniture inside of the room. Once an artist decided on the vanishing point, he could orient everything else using math so that he could present a realistic space. Fra Angelico was painting during the transition from the Byzantine and Gothic styles to the fully realized style of the Italian Renaissance. Artists were beginning to create more realism with perspective while still hanging on to many of the devices of the earlier styles, like the use of heretic scale. Angelico was that unique artist who was influenced by the humanism and realism of Giotto 
while not rejecting the older international Gothic style. Without copying either, Angelico creates his own unique melding of the old and the new, giving us the best of both worlds. Along the top of the colonnades is an entablature, and a pink line runs through it. If you follow that line, you will come to a secondary scene painted in the top left corner. This is the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. The angel with a sword is sending a grieving Adam and Eve out of paradise. As we have noted in other posts, it was common to include references to Christ's death in the paintings related to his birth. In the same way, it was also common for artists to look back, back to where the story started. Why was a savior needed? Why did God need to come as a baby to save his people? Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. Their story is a key element in the nativity story. In Christian doctrine, Jesus is sometimes referred to as the second Adam. Just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, so would salvation be brought by one man, Christ. In the same vein, Eve was the first to eat the fruit and was the mother of all and passed their original sin into all of humanity. In the same way, Mary would bear the Savior, and through her delivery, she would deliver the world. Mary is sometimes referred to as the second Eve. Mary's obedience, seen in this moment when she says, Be it done to me according to your word, negates the disobedience of Eve and begins the salvation story. Behind the angel Gabriel and Mary is a doorway, and if we look closely, we can see a curtain hanging inside. The curtain is a complicated piece of imagery that takes a bit to unpack. To understand the curtain iconography, we must first understand a few things about the temple. The temple complex is divided into distinct spaces. The central area is known as the Holy of Holies. The progression starts in the outer courts. This is where the Gentiles, or non-Jews, and women were allowed to be. Next, we come to the court of Israel, the area restricted to Jewish men who meet laws of cleanliness. For example, if you had touched a dead body, you would have to go through rituals of cleansing before being allowed into the temple. Beyond that were areas only the priests could enter, the holy place and the holy of holies. The holy of holies was only accessed once a year by one priest. In essence, the story of the temple is one of excluding greater and greater numbers of people as one approaches the holy of holies. There was a four-inch thick curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the sanctuary, and that curtain was the final symbol of humanity's separation from God, or of our expulsion from his presence. So in the top left corner of the painting, we have seen Adam and Eve being expelled from the Garden of Eden. And prior to this, Adam and Eve had walked in the garden in complete communion with God, and then they sinned and were expelled. The temple was a physical reminder as men walked into it, of their separation from God. They could no longer freely enter into his presence. Death was the punishment for entering the Holy of Holies, or God's presence. Only once per year would a representative of the nation pass beyond the curtain into the Holy of Holies, and there would make sacrifices to atone for the sins of the people. When Christ was crucified, the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom. This rending of the veil signified the work that Christ's sacrifice had accomplished. With his death and resurrection, the stain of sin was removed and mankind was free once again to enter into God's presence and enjoy the communion with him that Adam and Eve had experienced in the garden. So, why is the curtain included in an Annunciation painting? The Annunciation is considered to be the moment of this miraculous conception. If we were in any doubt that this was the case, the artist has included the dove descending to Mary to indicate that she will be with child by the Holy Spirit. The time that Mary is with child, she is sometimes referred to as the new Ark of the Covenant, just as the original Ark hidden behind the curtain was said to contain the uncontainable God or his presence. So Mary now contains God. In Mary's case, the doctrine goes beyond her containing God's presence, but that she actually contains God in the flesh. This is the miracle of the Incarnation. The Incarnation is the idea of God taking on human flesh to redeem his people. The moment Mary humbly accepts the angel's words, the salvation narrative that will 
end with that torn curtain begins. Most Annunciation and Nativity art includes some reference to Christ's death, as we will see in the other works in this series. In this particular painting, the artist has linked the expulsion from the garden, or our separation from God, to the curtain in the temple, or our reunion with God, creating in this one work the completed cycle. On an art history side note, the altarpiece contained four additional paintings in the predella, or the base. These were small pictures meant to praise the Virgin. On one of these is Mary's visit to Elizabeth, and we have the first identifiable landscape in Italian painting, and it is the view of the lake that would have been seen from Cortona. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like this video by giving us a thumbs up below and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss great commentary on classic works of art. KellyBagdanoff.com is your source for great content and curriculum, as well as devotional materials using the medium of art. Make sure you visit and subscribe. Pablo Picasso said, art washes from the soul the dust of everyday life. So take a moment to share this video because art is too important not to share. See you later, alligator.